Friends, this afternoon we're going to continue our series on life goals. Have you been enjoying this? Have you been interacting with your small groups during the week? Have you been discussing the material that we pass out in the manuals? I really hope and pray that you have because that's what will make this come alive. By discussing this, this material deeper in your, in your groups, it will truly allow you to reflect and apply and, and learn so much from each other. So we're going to continue today, Life Goals, True Success. True Success. Let me just remind you of what we've discussed in the past few weeks. First and foremost, we talked about the definition of true success. What's the definition? Becoming all that God wants you to be and doing all that He wants you to do. And hearing Him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Yes, The very first session we talked about was redefining success. What is success? And here's the bottom line. Worldly success is temporal, meaning all the achievements, all the accolades, all the accomplishments that you and I work on here in this world are temporal. They won't last. But we must be rich towards God. How? By living a life that pleases Him above everything else while seeking to enrich the lives of others. Brothers and sisters, don't just live for yourself because it's not worth it. At the end of of your life, it won't be a success. But if you take people along the journey with you, that's what will make it a success. Think of them as well. We talked about success in career. Success in career. Let me ask you, are you thankful to God for your source of provision? Are you? To be employed, to have a job, to own a business is a blessing today. It's a blessing. But how does that make you a success in career? Are you proclaiming him in your workplace so that others may know about him? That's the key. If you're working just for the sake of earning money, but not proclaiming him in your workplace, influencing with your clients, with your staff, with your people around you, it's not really worth it. Think about this. What good is it to have a career if you don't use it to draw others to God? We also talk about success in finances. Money belongs to who? Our money belongs to God. The question is, are we using it in ways He wants us to use it? Are we using it in ways He wants us to use it? The best thing is, are we living on less so we can help others more? God wants to bless others, and He uses us to bless them. The more faithful you are in being generous and help, helping others, the more God will bless you. Now, are we burying our one talent? That's the worst thing we can do whatever talent or treasure God has given us, if we bury it and just leave it on the ground and and don't do anything with it, that's the worst thing we can do. We talked about success in balancing life. And the bottom line is this. By first cultivating an intimate relationship with God, we can then focus on developing our physical, mental, relational, and emotional health with others and ourselves. Okay? Set right priorities. Can you all say that? Set priorities right priorities. That all involves time management. And then we talked about success in families last week. The bottom line is this, together with God, working hand in hand with God, not on our own, but working with God, we can build a loving and godly Christ-centered family. There is hope, friends. Whatever situation your family is in today, there is hope to have harmony and love, mutual respect, submission with one another. And when that family of yours is together, You can now impact the outside world. You can make a difference in the outside world. People will see you and and really want to know who your God is. And we'll never have perfect families. Let's face it. We'll never have perfect families. But when they see that your family is different, that it's God-centered, that will make all the difference. Well, remember, it's all about becoming all that God wants you to be. Before even doing, you need to become. In other words, your character has to be changed. In the past five weeks that we've been going through this material, I hope and pray that you've learned something and seen life in a different perspective, that God wants you to change. God wants you to to be something different. He wants you to keep improving. Here's my question to you. Are you more loving? Are you more compassionate? Are you more generous? Are you more focused on the right priorities? Are you more balanced with your time? Are you more considerate and committed to your family? 
I really hope and pray that we all improve in these areas because once you improve in these character traits in your person, then you can now overflow. Now it overflows, and the doing becomes natural. It's not forced. It's a natural byproduct of being what God wants you to be. And this doing will allow you to be a blessing to others, especially those in your family. Okay? Today we're going to look at the, the final session. But before the final session on legacy, we're going to learn what we need to do to focus on being faithful. Because that's what the definition talks about. It says, well done, good, and what? Faithful servant. What does it mean to be faithful? How will you and I ensure that our lives are led faithfully? Okay? The title of our message today is Finishing Well. Can you all say that? Finishing Well. And that's God's desire. He wants you to finish well. Would you agree that a lot of us, we start something, but many times we don't finish it? Yes or no? Yes. Many times, sadly, we like to start something, but then we don't finish it. Give me some examples of things you've started and you don't finish. Reading a book, okay, yes. Like maybe the Bible, okay. What else? Exercise, yes. Anapa, anapa. Homework, yes. Oh, what else? Diet, yes. Anything else? Writing a book, right? Saving for the future. We start many things, but we don't finish it. Well, let me just show you some examples. Here's, here's a person who wants to start exercising. So starting to lose weight and, and exercise regularly. So watch this. <laughs> okay, how about starting to learn how to cook? Those of you who like to cook, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. Or those who want to start to learn a new sport like these youngsters, huh? <laughs> and maybe you want to start learning how to play a musical instrument. It starts out great, you know, that's... Oh, yes, it, he's ganado. Yeah, yeah, go for it. But after a while, ayoko na, tama na to, too much. Finishing well. The moment you and I give our lives to Christ, we are starting our race. Do you realize that? The moment you entrust your life to Him, you are now committed to Him, you are starting your race. The question I want to ask you is, have you done that? Have you entrusted your life to Christ? That's where it all starts. You haven't even started the race if you, have, if you don't have a relationship with Him. I see many, and I know many Christians, who are so dedicated, committed in the beginning of life. But as time goes on, as trials and burdens and issues come into their life, they start to slow down to the point where they eventually they quit. I don't see them anymore. They've disqualified themselves from the race. They've chosen to stop following Christ. And it's a sad situation, but it happens many times. If we want to be successful until the very end of our life and leave a legacy, which is the discussion next week, what must we do? What must we focus on to ensure that we will finish well? The Apostle Paul is a great example. The Apostle Paul, if you know his life, he started out, his name was Saul. And his mission, his vision, his career was, was all about a passion to eradicate and to persecute all those people following this man by the name of Jesus Christ. That's what he did. He went on crusades to hunt them down, all these Christians. Now, at one point when he was going to Damascus, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 9 that Jesus appeared to Paul in a bright light. And this is after Jesus had already ascended. And when Jesus appeared to Saul, Saul went down on his knees and he repented for all that he was doing. And he says, Lord, what would you have me do? Paul, Saul, committed his life to Christ at that moment. And then he, his mission changed. His mission was to go forth and to, to preach the word, the word, to share the gospel of salvation to everyone. That was his mission. His name was changed from Saul to Paul. And after many years of struggles, many years of suffering, many years of, of hardship and victory, the apostle Paul came to the end of his life and at the end of his life, he had something important to say. He gave a farewell message of encouragement to his disciple Timothy, who was leading the church in Ephesus. And that message to Timothy is also to all of us, all of us who are the future followers of Jesus Christ. 
the last epistle of the, of the Apostle Paul written to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want us all to stand up and read this together. Let's all stand and read this together. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. Everyone, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all duties of your ministry. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time of my departure is near. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. And I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to also to all who have longed for his appearing. Please be seated. What a rich passage, isn't it? It's such a rich passage. This is like, it's like the Apostle Paul was giving his, his own memorial address just before he leaves. You see, Paul, at the end of his life, knew that he was going to die. He was already in prison in Rome, and the emperor Nero started blaming the Christians for the fire. And they used that as a reason to, to behead Paul. So in AD 67, the apostle Paul was beheaded. For us today, the life of the apostle Paul is such an encouragement. Why? Because he, he was persevering all the way till the very end. He kept his faith in spite of all the hardship trials that he went through. And to us, I believe today, we can follow his example. He mentions three key areas, three key areas that he's confident will lead him into the Savior's arms, that he will hear the sweet words of Jesus saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. What are those three key phrases? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, it says there, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. These are the three areas that he really wants to, that he's confident that he's already accomplished. What about us? When you're at the end of your life, will you be able to say this with confidence? Because the truth is we don't know when we're going to go. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. We have no idea. What will people say when you are in your casket, in your memorial service? What will they say? I heard a story about these three guys who got together and they started discussing what will people say about us when we die? Let me ask you, they ask each other. The first guy said, you know, I want people to say when they look at my casket, they look at me, they'll say, oh, this man was a family man. He loved his family so much. What about you? They asked the second guy. The second guy said, oh, I want people to say when they see me, they'll say, this man was such a godly man. He served God all his life in people. They asked the third guy, what about you? What do you want people to say? He said, I want people to say when they see me in my casket, they'll say, look, he's moving. What will people say about you when it's the end of your life? You might be a teenager today. You might be in your mid-30s. You might even be a senior. We never know. But that day will come when you're face to face with God. Will you be confident to say the same thing that the Apostle Paul said? I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. And I've kept the faith. Let's look at the very first one. The very first one says, fight the good fight. Can you all say that? Fight, fight the good fight. Understand that Paul, he lived a God-determined life. It wasn't easy to follow God, but he was determined to go all the way to the end. Why do we say that? He says there, I have fought the good fight. What fight is this, friends? What fight is he talking about? What fight is this? Do you realize he's talking about the constant struggle that you and I face every day through life? 
If I were to sit down with each of you individually and ask you, tell me your life story. What's the drama of your life? I'm sure each and every one of you would have something to say about all the things you've gone through, the struggles, the difficulties, and, and hardships. But today you have hope. But we all have gone through something. Do you realize that the struggle, the fight that we are really in, is not what you think it is. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it tells us, for our struggle is what? Not against flesh and blood. It's not a physical struggle, but against the rulers. Continue. Against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. The Apostle Paul is telling us, guys, you're not fighting each other. The battle is not against your fellow man. It's not against, you know, your wife or your kids. It's not against each other. It's, a, it's against the spiritual realm. Do you believe that there's a spiritual realm going on around us? After 32 years of ministry, I will tell you this is real. There are really demonic forces around us doing everything they can to attack us. You as a Christian are constantly in battle. You are at war. You are a target. Now, if you're not a target today, either of two things is true. First, you're, you're perfect. Or secondly, you've already surrendered to the enemy. I don't know where you are, okay? But you have two main enemies in your life today. The first one is pride. And the second is the devil himself. Jesus overcame so we can overcome. We need to follow Jesus' example he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. Yet without sin. So today, if you feel down, if you feel discouraged, I want you to read about how Jesus overcame all the obstacles in his life. And he was victorious. Be encouraged through the life of Jesus. Today, you might feel like you don't belong in your family. There's too much strife. There's too much struggles. There's too much strain and stress. And, and you don't feel like you belong there. Maybe you feel like Daniel in the lion's den in your office because everyone is against you. Maybe in school you're being persecuted by all your fellow students. Friends, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you can overcome. One thing that I believe gets in the way of over overcoming is the word if. Can you all say that? If. If. In Tagalog, kung. Huh? What do we say? We say, if implies uncertainty. If implies doubt. If implies impossibilities. If, if. We always say if. If I was just not so sickly. If I was just not in debt. If I could just stop pornography. If my parents and my children would finally give their lives to the Lord. If I could just overcome these addictions and these habits in my life if I could ever find a husband. You know, it goes on and on. What is your if today? What is the if in your life that you constantly hear today? Let me just say something. You see, friends, it's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. Can you all say when? It's a matter of when. As you serve Jesus Christ, it's when you get out of debt. It's when your parents or children are going to come to the Lord. It's when you get rid of your habits and addictions. I heard of this one father who was asked, how are you going to support your family when you've got so much debt, you've got so many bills, how are you going to provide for them? You know what he answered? He said, I've learned my lesson the hard way. And today, I'm going to start practicing the principles of financial, financial management from the Bible. I'm going to follow Jesus' way. And I know that it's just a matter of days when I will be out of debt. Do you see his heart? He's not living in the if. He's living in the when. Because he's trusting in God to take him through that difficult time to be free, set free. Friends, don't focus on the if. Focus on the when. We need to follow the example of Jesus. He was in the wilderness after being baptized for how many days? 40 days. And while he was in the wilderness, he did not eat. He fasted and he prayed 40 days and 40 nights. So you can imagine Jesus. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was all alone. 
He was tired. And then guess who showed up? The big, ugly if shows up. The enemy, the Bible says. The enemy came and tempted Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, it says there, the enemy says to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Come on, Jesus, go ahead and do it. I know you can do it, Jesus. You're hungry, you're tired, go ahead. Turn these stones into bread. Well, it wasn't Jesus' time yet. The enemy was offering Jesus a temporary fix. But Jesus did not go by the timetable of the enemy. Jesus wanted to go by the timetable of his Father. He wanted to give, he wanted to follow God's plan, God's eternal plan, which brings God eternal glory, not the devil's plan. Jesus did not follow him. Have you found yourself today in a wilderness? And somehow you're tempted to prove you are something? In some way you want to prove your pride and self-esteem. You want to show that you can do things your way and not God's way. You can do things on your own. Friends, the truth of the matter is that Jesus was not interested in proving himself to anybody because he didn't have to. In Matthew 4, 4, he declared, but he answered and said, it is written. Notice, he used God's word. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Continue. But on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He was declaring, God is my supply. God is my provider. God gives me all that I need. God is enough. I don't need to do anything. I don't need to prove anything to you. I don't need to show you anything. In other words, I don't need to prove your if. That's what he was saying. Isn't that just like the enemy who tries to ruin us, who tries to undermine our confidence? He tries to dispute our worth. Oftentimes, the enemy will try to knock us out of our position in Christ Take out Jesus from our authority. Remove him from, remove all his power and grace from our lives. Friends, let me just encourage you. Let me encourage you. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. Follow the example of Jesus. Fight the enemy. How? Use God's word. Be confident and use God's word. And when you use God's word, it's a matter of when God will be glorified. Don't let the evil devil say to you, you know, if God were really God... This wouldn't be happening in your life. If God is God and He loves you, your children would come to church. If God is a healer, you wouldn't be sick. Don't entertain those thoughts. The enemy wants to reduce you to who He is. And He is worthless. He's nothing. He is absolutely nothing. You, on the other hand, are a child of the God Most High. You belong in the heavenlies, not here. And you can fight the enemy with the weapons that God gives us, the spiritual weapons. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7 tells us, what's the weapon? The word of truth and the power of God by the, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left hand. We have weapons on both hands. We're equipped, friends. When you are weak, don't give up. No that the Word of God is always strong. And the Spirit of God works in and through us. The Word of God encourages us that when we fight the good fight, we fight to win. We need to get rid of the ifs and hold on to the whens. Are you with me? We must use God's Word for us because the enemy uses God's Word against us. We've got to wield the sword of the Spirit and fight with His Word. We're given two great weapons, two great weapons that we need to resist the assail of the evil one. And those two great weapons are the Spirit of God and the Word of God. These work hand in hand together. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, everyone, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. In other words, the Spirit wields the sword. The fight of faith is fought with the Word of God, with God's Word. Temptation is not sin until it's acted upon. Remember that. Until it's acted upon. And God says to us in 2 Corinthians 10, 13, He says, No temptation, continue, has overtaken you, but such is as common to man. And God is faithful. God is 
faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Don't you like that verse? He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, because we will experience temptations, what will he do? He will provide a way of escape also that you will be able to endure it. That way of escape does not mean that you just escape free and don't experience it. No, as you escape, you're able to endure that temptation till victory. Friends, God protects us, but he looks down upon us with confidence. He doesn't say, oh, if my child gets out. No, no, no. He's saying, when my child gets out. He knows that if we take his word and begin to fight the evil one with his word, it's just a matter of when. Don't use your flesh to overcome. He is certain about your future. Why? Because he's given you everything you need to succeed in the spiritual battle of your life. Today, I want you to ask yourself, what are the battles that you're facing? What is the if that you need to turn into the when? Are you fighting the battles with your own flesh? People are not your enemies. Look beyond that. See the truth that there's a spiritual realm behind what's happening in your life. Friends, God is for you. He's not against you. He will not allow anything to happen in your life that first does not pass through his hands. Don't run from your enemy. Don't run from your enemy. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, submit yourself unto God. Continue. Resist the enemy and he will flee. He will flee from you. He will flee from you. Don't listen to those voices of doubt. Don't listen to those voices of uncertainty, those voices of, of discouragement. Stand your ground, friends. Stand your ground with God and fight the good fight, and you will overcome. You will overcome. We have an awesome God. Amen? Amen. The principle we learn here is this, and take note. Don't take for granted the disciplines of faith. What are the disciplines of faith? Well, you've got daily prayer, daily connecting with our God. Why? Hearing the message, his message to us, getting into his word and fellowshipping with other believers. Don't take any of this for granted, friends, because if you do, that only means that you're trusting in yourself, your own abilities, your own power, your own experience, whatever, that useless. You need to be connected to him on a daily basis. These are the disciplines of faith that we should never take for granted. Ask yourself, how can you be strong for your family in the time of need when you've you're, you're basing your life on your own strength, not God's strength. You who are truly committed to God are targets of the enemy every day. That's just the plain fact. That's the truth. Please pray for me. Please pray for my family as I pray for you. Today, those of you who are not committed to Jesus, you have no worries. You have no worries because you're on the enemy's side. But dear precious believers, those of you who are committed to him, I want you to fight the good fight all the way to the end. Recognize that each day is a spiritual battle. But you have the weapons to fight them. And you have the God who's behind you. Don't let your guard down. Don't trust in your own confidence. Stand firm, convicted, clothed in the armor that God has given you. You are a spiritual warrior of faith. So, fight the good fight. Number two, everyone... Finish the race. Finish the race. In the case of Paul, Paul lived a God-directed life. Not just a God-determined life, but a God-directed life. What does that mean? He says here to us, I have finished the race. Paul knows that there was a course, a, a course, a path, a journey that he must take with God. And despite the hardship, despite the suffering and pain that he endured, he never gave up. He continued following that. Why? Because he knew that this is where God wanted him to go. He went on three missionary journeys. And, and we did that several years ago to these different places. And it, in Paul's time, it was so difficult to share God's word with people, especially when they persecute you. They try to kill you in the process. But Paul is saying that he followed the course that the Lord himself set out for him. Whatever it was, he followed the Lord. What about us today? Are there times that you want to just call it quits? Are there times that you just want to give up, throw in the towel, go AWOL? 
Are you experiencing so many trials, so much crisis that, that you just want to say, Tamana, I, I can't anymore. I just, I just want to stop. Friends, how will you and I finish the race? Because we need to finish this race. You can't sit on the sideline. You need to finish the race. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, everyone, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Continue. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. The Bible doesn't lie to us. The Bible tells us there is a race and you need endurance. That simply means you and I need perseverance. This is not an easy race. It's a long race. And your race ends the minute your heartbeat stops. So we've got a long way to go. But if you want to make it to the finish line, if you want to make it to the very end, you need to be able to release and let go of things in your life. Can you all say let go? Let go. Call it simplifying life. Simplifying life. You see, there are some things that we need to lay aside, honestly, friends, in order to finish well. What kind of things is the Bible talking about when it says lay aside these things? These are the things that get you discouraged, that get you disappointed, frustrated with life. Let me illustrate it to you. These things in your life that weigh you down are things that burn you out, like, like a light bulb. Okay, If you take one light bulb and you attach it to a single battery, that battery might last for a little time. But if you attach 100 light bulbs to a single battery, that battery will die right away. What about us? Look at your schedule in life today. Do you keep adding things to it over and over again? Because as you do, you might find yourself so discouraged, so disheartened and disappointed. Why? Because you can't fulfill all these things. There are just too many things. Hebrews 12.1, I want to focus on these two words. The word wait and the word sin. Can you all say that? Wait and sin. What's it talking about? A wait is anything that slows us down. A wait could be a relationship that's not godly. A wait could be an activity that is meaningless. It could be a sport. It could be an event. It could be all kinds of things, even a job, a project. It does not have to be a bad thing. As a matter of fact, a wait could be a good thing. It could be something good. But if you get too many good things in your schedule, in your life, you will miss out on the best thing that God wants you to do in your life. Are you with me? You need to learn to say no in order to grow. Let me say that again. You need to say no in order to grow. I ask people, how are you doing? They say, I'm so busy. Hey, slow down. Jesus does not expect you to do everything. He doesn't expect you to do everything. Because a weight can sometimes be expectations from other people. Are you living for the expectations of others? Are you living to please other people? It can be so difficult to please others. You could, the weight in your life could be a memory of the past. That memory weighs you down. Why? Because there's so much pain. There's so much hurt. You're scarred. The problem is, friends, you cannot live in the past. You likewise cannot live in the future. You and I, we can only live in the now. That's it. Trying to do anything else and everything else will weigh you down. Whatever that weight is, my friends, whatever that weight is, and it's not working in your life, it's time to let it go. You need to let it go. I want you right now to just think in your hearts and minds. Do you feel overburdened? Overwhelmed? Do you feel like you're, you're just burning the candle on both ends, that there's just not enough time in your day to do what you have to do? Could it be that there's some issues that you need to let go of? This is where application comes. You need to really ask yourself, it could be a good thing, but it could be something that God maybe wants you not to do right now. It's okay to say no, friends. It's okay to say no. Identify what that is and set it aside. Set it aside. Don't feel guilty because you have your own course. You have your own course to run. Everyone wants you to run their course. And that's why you're overwhelmed. Now, when it comes to sin, we talked about weight. What about sin? Sin's obvious. You know what sin is, right? You know what sin is. Anything that displeases God, anything that goes against his moral values, his principles, against the commandments, you know what sin is. 
Could it be today that there's a sin in your life that you've overlooked, you've taken for granted? You continue to act like a Christian, do Christian things, but in the privacy of your own quiet life, you know that there's something still there. Whatever that something is, that sin, it's slowing you down. That guilt, or maybe you don't even have guilt, but that that thing slows you down. You need to identify it and you need to deal with it. You need to deal with it. Don't continue living your life trying to fool yourself. You're not fooling God. But it's, it's a sad situation. If You know, later on in your life, you discover, I've really got to get rid of it. You've wasted all that time holding on to that, that sin that easily trips you up. James chapter 4, verse 17 says this. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Friends, if you know that there's something good that you should do and you choose not to do it, that in itself is sin. When it comes to finances, for example, money, practical application, you know that you should always spend less than you earn, right? Spend less than you earn. Because if you spend more than you earn, if you go on a buying spree, you go on a shopping spree, you're going to start incurring debt. You're going to start maxing out your credit card and you're not going to be financially healthy. So ask yourself, what am I doing with my life today? Am I trying to keep up with the Jonases, with the Reyeses, or whoever you're comparing your family to, your life with? Live within your means so that you can lay aside the weight of financial debt and run your race well. What's the principle here? Let go of the things that hold you back. Let go of the things that hold you back. My dear brothers and sisters, I love you guys so much. I don't want you to carry around with you too much that hinders you from going forward. Take action in your life. Really, only you can do this. You know, I would love to teach Bible studies every day. I would love to give all the graduation speeches, all the company, out, company speeches, all the church invitations. It's nonstop. But you know, if I accept all of that, I will be burnt out. My first and foremost responsibility is to my family, first and foremost. And then to my responsibility for you, the church. Keep your life simple. Keep your life simple. That way you can run your race all the way to the end. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, Let us not, what? Become weary. Don't be weary or tired in doing good. Notice, in doing good. We all want to do good. For at the proper time, continue, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Today I want to encourage you, those of you who want to stop, to give up, to slow down, Jesus is saying to you, keep up. Don't give in. Don't give up. Stay in the race. Don't turn to the side. He's saying, come on, you can do it. You can do it. Remember, keep up the speed and don't slow down. Now, don't run your race for temporary trophies or medals that come with the recognition of man. Those trophies that were given on this earth, that's nothing. You and I ought to run for the eternal reward that God has in store for us. That's what counts. That's what really matters. Make your life count by doing that. Focusing on what God has for you in the eternal rather than the temporal. Jesus himself cares how you finish. He truly does. And he's waiting at the finish line with a big smile and his arms open wide just for you. So fight the good fight, finish the race, and keep the faith. Keep the faith. In the case of the Apostle Paul, Paul lived with a God-devoted life. He was devoted to God through his faith. Devoted. He says to us, I have kept the faith. My question to all of us is, what does it mean to keep the faith? Keep the faith. As I studied this, I realized the word keep is to treasure, to possess, to guard, to protect, to, to cherish. You keep. And you, what are you keeping? You're keeping the faith. Our faith. If we don't have faith, friends, we don't have anything. Keep the faith. You know what this boils down to? It's having the right goal. Having the right goal is keeping the faith. What is your goal when it comes to your faith? Here's the question. What is your life goal? If I were to ask you, what is your life goal? Over and above all the things that you do in this world, what is your life goal? Let me suggest something to you. It comes from the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. It says, So we make it our goal to what? To please Him. 
whether we are at home in the body or away. What's the Apostle Paul saying? Whether we are at home in the body, meaning while we are here physically alive on this earth or away or we're dead, either way, he says, my goal is to please him. Can you all say that? Our goal is to please him. Think about this. Just think about this. If your goal, your number one goal is to please him, it will simplify your life. Over 90% of the issues, decisions, challenges that you face in life, all of that will be solved and settled if you make pleasing God your number one goal. What do I mean? Let me give you an example. Cindy and I are very busy sometimes counseling other people, counseling couples and singles, etc. And we do this because there are some people who are very close to us, dear to us. We don't counsel everyone. We praise God for the hundreds of D group leaders who are equipped, who are trained to counsel others so people don't rely on us all the time. Now, when a couple comes to us with their problems, we sit down with them, and normally we want to listen to their hearts. And they share all their issues, what they're going through, their hurts with each other. And this can go on for hours and hours. So what we try to do is say, okay, wait, let's first get to the, the bottom line. What is your goal? What is your goal? What is your goal in life? That's the question. Well, they answer, but when they answer, it's not direct. It's, well, it's this and that, and they beat around the bush. So we stop. Okay, wait, wait. Are you a follower of Christ? And they say, yes, yes, we're Christian. Okay. As a child of God, what is your number one primary goal? Is it to please God? Think about it. You yourself, is your number one goal to please God? Because if it is, listen, if your husband or your wife does not meet your expectations and, and does something that really hurts you, really affects you, you must do your part because your goal is to please God. You see? So your life is not dependent on other people. My life is simply I will follow my role to please God and fulfill my role as a husband or a wife. I'm reminded of this woman, true story. She, she found out her husband was un, unfaithful, having an affair. And this was not theory. It, it was real. The husband confessed. He admitted this. She was faced with a decision being heartbroken and devastated, crying, she faced a decision, a choice. Is she going to leave her husband, kick him out of the house, or is she going to please the Lord? Notice, two options. She prayed about it, and after so many tears, and, and just the, the, oh, it's just hard to explain, but just the, the hurt, she made a decision after praying, she says, you know, God wants me to take the godly position, and that is to please him. Therefore, I will forgive my husband, not for his sake, but for God's sake. And if he chooses to continue to live as a bad husband, that's up to him. God will deal with him, but I am going to please the Lord. You see how that works? That's how it works. Friends, if your motive is not to please the Lord then it will be very difficult for you to keep the faith. How can I keep the faith if, if my goal is not to please God? It's so difficult to please other people. You're going to get discouraged. You're going to get disappointed because it's very hard to please people. It really is. The goal for every person who follows the Lord Jesus Christ must be to please the Lord. And that will settle many, many, many issues in your life. For example, years ago this man came to me. He wanted to ask for advice. He says, I've been offered a job to... Uh, be a dealer in a casino. Should I take the job or not? I asked him, are you a follower of Christ? He says, yes. I said, what is your goal in life? Is it to please him? Because if it is, then you ask God, Lord, do you want me to serve you by being a gambling dealer in a casino? You ask yourself that question. I said, I'm not going to give you an answer, but you listen to God for that answer. So he left and he called me later. He says, okay, my question's answered. All right. Now, you have to understand, keeping the faith, having the goal of pleasing God simplifies your life. Example, dating. Singles. Okay, singles here. Sometimes singles say, can I date this guy? Can I go out with him? Is it okay if I see him regularly? What do I do? Can he be my boyfriend? You know, things like that. And he's not a Christian. What do I do? So these are the questions that they have in their minds. And, and you have to ask yourself, what is your primary goal? 
Is it to please God? Do you want to follow God? So then you ask yourself the question. Uh, they, they changed the question. They asked me, okay, wait, what if we change it? I don't want to marry him, but I just want to go out on dates with him. It's not a big difference. You know, I, I say to them, listen, be careful because when you go out with a person on a regular basis, your heart will fall for them. The rule of life is the more time you spend with someone, your heart will, will be drawn to each other. And then what? And then what? So you ask yourself the question, will this please God? Will this please God? Having the right goal leads to the right direction. It leads you in the right direction. It'll greatly help you make all your decisions. Young people, sometimes they go to their, to their parents and say, Dad, should I play computer games or should I study? Wow, that's a tough question, right? <laughs> You're a student first, so what should you do? Well, computer games or study. You know, the parents should say, look, you ask God. Do you, do you, do you want to please God? Is that your goal in life, to please Him? Okay, then you ask him, Lord, do you want to play computer games or study first? What, what do you want me to do? Now, if your child comes to you and say, the Lord told me to play computer games, then I, I'm worried. I, I'm scared. What Lord is he talking to? <laughs> Friends, be honest with yourself. Truly be honest with yourself. It sounds simple, but it's, it's what God wants. He doesn't want you to have a difficult time making decisions. Simply pursue the right goal. And the right goal is please God. Why is this important? Why is this important? I'm reminded of an article about a man by the name of Bernie Madoff. Did you hear about this guy? Several years ago, he was convicted for running a multi-million uh, money pyramiding scheme. It was a scam, Ponzi scam. And he deceived thousands of people by getting their money, saying that it's interest that he'll give them back. And he wiped out their, their accounts. In the end, he was sentenced to 150 years in prison. And he was already in his almost 80s. Can you imagine how many lifetimes in prison that would be? You see, this man, Bernie, had the wrong goal. His goal in life was to enrich himself, to live in luxury, to live in, in class. And, and he didn't care about people's hearts, people's lives. He just wanted to think about himself. When he went through the trial, his face never changed his face was stern and hard, un, unrepentant, no remorse, no regret. That's how he went through it. He went to jail. His son, his son's name is Mark Madoff, 46 years old, committed suicide by hanging himself. And when his father heard about his son, that's when the father was impacted. But too late. It was too late. You see, friends, your goal will determine your direction. Your goal will determine your behavior and actions. Bernie's goal was wrong all along. See, friends, if, you're, if your goal is money, if your goal is to make money, then what will happen is that you'll be tempted to be so rich, to, be so, um, to have so much money that you'll be tempted to compromise. You'll be tempted to compromise but if you make pleasing God your number one goal, then all your sub-goals will be counter-checked by that primary goal. You know what I'm talking about? The principle here is this. Make pleasing the Lord your primary goal in life. And your daily decisions will be simplified. You, each and every one of you here, is uniquely gifted. You have all been given talents. You've all been given resources. You've all been given gifts. You've all been given influence. For what purpose? Why have you been given all these things by God? To please yourself? Many people think, my goal is to please myself, to be happy. Friends, if that's your goal, you have a problem. You truly have a problem. I have nothing against people who want to be ambitious, who want to be excellent in their careers. No problem there. But that ambition should only come second to your first and primary goal, to please <laughs> God. Will you turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, please God. Please God. We shall all one day stand before our Lord. Stand before Him. And Paul says on that special day, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, he says, in the future, let's read that together, in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Notice what he says. 
there's a crown of righteousness waiting for him. He's assured of that. He's confident of that coming to him. And it's going to be given by the Lord himself. The Lord will give him that crown of righteousness, but not only to him, but to all. You know what my prayer is? And you pray for me. My prayer is that all of us, can you imagine? All of us will be given this special crown of righteousness by God himself on that special day. Friends, finish well. Finish well. Imagine if you live your life fighting the good fight, finishing the race, keeping the faith. Imagine how this will impact your family. Impact how this will impact your school. Imagine how it will impact your office, your community, wherever you are. Teenagers, you'll be different. Parents, you will be different. Seniors, you will be different. The way you love your family, the way you perform in school, the way you conduct your business, the way you live your life, all of that will be different. Why? Because your desire is to please God and bring glory to His name. At the end of your life, I pray that every single one of you will be confident, confident to say, Lord, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I have kept the faith. And he will look at you with arms open wide and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Did you learn something today? Friends, it's easy to get information. After a few days, you'll forget everything I said. My prayer is that each and every one of you here will write down one or two things that you will take action in your life. Whatever it is that God has spoken to your heart today, don't Set it aside. Take action. Apply it. And that's what brings about transformation in your life. That's what brings about blessings in your life. So may you be blessed. I was inspired again this week. The title of the poem is The Race of Life. The Race of Life. We are all running the race, seeking to win by God's grace. Focused on the prize at the finish line, while our flesh wants to sit in the sideline. Isn't that true? Knowing our Lord has run this race ahead, we can be confident because of the blood He shed. The world tries to grab our hearts to slow us down, but no temptation is going to keep us from our crown. Together, we need to encourage one another to run as God's family in fellowship with hearts as one. There will be times that we will tire and perspire. Just fix our eyes on Jesus and He will inspire. Don't let the weight of the distractions and sins keep you slow. Learn to release and say, no. It's always best to let go. Look ahead and never behind. Set aside our foolish pride, knowing that Jesus is waiting for us with arms open wide. Crossing the finish line, hearing our great shepherd, our pastor say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. <laughs> Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Father, we thank you. We overwhelmingly thank you, Lord, for all that you are in our lives. Thank you, Father, for the reminder of your word that we need to be intentional with our life today. We cannot just live it on a day-to-day -day basis, letting things just happen, but we must make things happen. I pray for all my brothers and sisters here, Father, that they would truly laser their lives to a focus, to a clear direction, to a, a firm faith, to, to stand with the Word to fight the enemy. I pray for every single family represented here, Father, that you would use each member here to bring about change, life change. Father, we totally trust in you. We cannot do this on our own. We cling to you, Father. We embrace you. We know that it's only by your grace that we can do this on a daily basis. Thank you, Father, that you will never leave us or desert us and that you're with us every step of the way. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pray for those who are here today who may have never taken that step of faith 
to surrender their lives to you, to commit themselves to you, Father. Friend, you know who you are. God has brought you here today for this special purpose. God wants to take you in, into his family. He wants to make you part of his family. Would you pray this prayer? But make it a prayer between you and God himself. Let me lead you in that prayer. Lord God, I come before you, admitting that I'm a sinner, that I've done things that I'm ashamed of. I've hurt you. I've displeased you. Lord, forgive me as I repent of those sins. I realize how much you love me, that your love was unconditional, as I am with all my sins and all. But yet, Lord, you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to come to this earth to die as a sinless sacrifice on that cross to pay for all my sins. Today, right now, I give you my life. I receive Jesus as my sacrifice to pay for all my sins. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you for purifying me from all my sins, Lord. I'm yours. I'm yours. Thank you, Father, that I can have a brand new start in life, that I can walk hand in hand with you till the end of my life. Lord, I want to make it to the finish line with you. Thank you, Father. I pray for all of us here that we would be shining lights in this dark world, that wherever we go, Lord, people will see the difference in us. And may our lives draw others to you, Lord. Allow us to impact and make a difference wherever we are to whomever we are. We thank you, Father, for your love, your mercy, and grace. We give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise that you and you alone deserve. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen and amen. Glory be to God. I love you guys.